Okay, everybody will make a start for the next session. This session is called After Empire, Memory and Post-Coloniality. And the first speaker in this panel is Yi Hyun Lim, who's speaking on victimhood in the East European memory regime, transmuting memories from the post-imperial to the post-colonial. And just a little bit more on our speaker. Um, he is Professor of Transnational History um, in Critical Global Studies Institute at Sogang University um, in Korea. And he is the author of many different works on memory, including Victimhood, Nationalism and Contested Memories, um, in a book by us and Conrad called Memory in a Global Age and two of his major um, publications are also Victimhood and Historical Authenticity and Master's Dictatorship and Memory um, in I can't read your writing <laughs> in something as an ever present as an ever present past over to you thank you thank you um, shall I stand there okay okay um, I have to apologize that I revised my title slightly after having arrived in uh, Warsaw on uh, last weekend. So after having been accustomed to the recent debates here, I, I could not resist temptation to change a little bit uh, about my, uh, of my um, presentation. Okay? Um, how to problematize? As you, many of you know, in Poland, there was a very strange debate uh, in the Dievelt and Gazeta Viborcha between Jan Gross, Mola, and Jaremba. Actually, the main point was that the Jan Gross argument, the Polish society's, uh, how can I say, certain reluctance to accept refugees from Syria and Afghanistan and from other countries is related with the not a successful coming to terms with the past of the with the Holocaust or with the crimes on Jews. That was uh, the uh, Jan Gross argument, and uh, so second argument is a little bit strange one. So I don't want to talk about the factological debate, but about the narrative template underlying the memory debate between uh, Jan Gross and the small and Jaremba and the others. So I want to focus on the interconnectedness between analytical history and collective remembrance. Uh, to form the memory regime. It means that the, some, some researches shows us that the, when children or some low teens began to remember what happened in their own society, it is very much, uh, their uh, remembering relies on very much uh, historical knowledge they learn from the school. So actually, Centrum Badan Opinion Sports is, is a center for the research of public opinion in Poland. One of the best things I think the Polish socialists are doing is that doing the public opinion on the historical consciousness among the ordinary Poles. It is very rare to find such an opinion poll in other countries. So we have a very precious uh, certain materials that was done by the, the Center for uh, the uh, Research of Public Opinion. So in the 1999 public opinion that, so about 73% of the respondents replied that they got the knowledge of the Second World War from school. Means that history class is very important still in the in, in the in the 1999. So I want to apply the concept of narrative template that was uh, developed by James Warch in the analyzing a Russian case uh, to the Polish case. I'm just knocking on the possibility of applying this, and then this small larger ember. They they just uh, criticized uh, the. Uh, Jan Gross argument by saying that Eastern Europe or uh, Postal, po People's Poland did not have any contact with the other people, especially Islam people from the Arab land. So there's a difference between uh, East, Western Europe, which has been experienced in contacting with those people of the former colonial subjects and so on. But it's only partly true. So actually Poland was the country which accepted the refugees from Chechen in the 1990s. More than 100,000 Chechen refugees came to Poland and Polish society greeted them, welcomed them 
very much in the early mid 1990s. So Malika Abdul Vahabova. So actually, after after arriving here, I could buy this Vienshi and I could read this round table. And the she Malika, she is a Chechen refugee who came to Poland in mid 1990s, and she remembers that Polish neighbors actually their attitude was quite warm towards her. Or, or some other Chechen refugees at the first time, but only recently she could recognize that they, her Polish neighbors began to change the, their attitude toward her from a sort of warm um, uh, empathy or sympathy towards a sort of apathy or even certain, how can I say, certain very negative way. So I think that uh, these, uh, uh, I want to reformulate the uh, Polish debate between uh, those Gross, Sharemba, Smola, and others in a different language. I mean that, uh, for example, empathy, empathy towards the Islam refugees, it's not just uh, depends on the divergence of Western colonial guilt or, and the Eastern legacy of anti-Semitism. And so I think that the Holocaust and the empathy and the uh, past of Second World War could be reformularized or reformulated uh, from the perspective of post-colonial. And W.E.B. Du Bois, is, is, uh, uh, reminiscence is very, very intriguing in this. In the early 20th century, while he was studying sociology in Berlin, he paid a visit uh, to Krakow. So there was no car at that time, and that the Polish cart driver you know, he said, they, perhaps they converse, they, 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 converse, they uh, talk to each other in German because uh, the, um, the uh, two boys were studying in Germany, in Berlin, and this, this uh, cut to drive in Krakow, this Habsburg the subject, so they could communicate in German. And then Polish cut driver uh, said to Du Bois, I know a hotel which is run by your people. And then Polish cut driver, uh, you know, led him to a hotel run by a Polish Jew in Krakow. So that was very, very interesting anecdote to show a certain, you know, threat that is running between, 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 you know, certain uh, Polish attitude towards Jews as, as ethnic minorities and certain post-colonial things. Perhaps that's why I think that W. E. Du Bois uh, visited again uh, the ghetto, ruin, ruins of ghetto in the 1948, 49, I think, after the Sociological Congress in Moscow on the way back to United States. Very intentionally, he visited Warsaw Ghetto, and he, he left a very interesting uh, the travel log on the uh, ruins of uh, Warsaw Ghetto. So I think this is just a very a sort of funny anecdote, but it's this very telling. In this very telling his experience in Krakow. So, and then the, in order to understand this uh, uh, gross, uh, small, and Jaramba controversy, or the, uh, the relationship or connectivity between uh, anti Semitism or as a Polish attitude towards Jews and, and Polish attitude towards the, uh, against the refugees, I think that it's not a typical Pol Polish symptom. I mean that this uh, Bernard stereotype of any anti-Semitic Poland explains nothing. If we have a look at the work uh, by Peter Lagru, we can find uh, re actually anti-Semitism has been quite prevalent immediately after the Second World War in Western Europe. And then these uh, things, and the Vichy France is, of course, and the, uh, the the, there was on the, the gendarmes, uh, the report on the demonstration with the slogan France to the French on the April 19, 1945 in Paris. Do you know why? What motivated that demonstration? Because a Jewish returnee to Paris demanded the return of his apartment, which was occupied by a, by a French. Then this French guy who had to, uh, the, you know, make this uh, apartment vacant, he, and then, his Parisian colleagues organized this, this demonstration. And also in Netherlands, you know, approximately 80% of Jews in Netherlands were exterminated during the Second World War. I think that considering the occupation uh, condition in Netherlands is much, much milder than Poland. So I think that this Poland is not exceptional uh, for, the, for the, the rate of uh, extermination of Jews. So I think that the Polish anti-Semitism is a typical stereotype in a sense, in a sense, Western Europe 
the immediate threat to the Second World War shared a certain attitude towards Jews as an ethnic minority or as others. So Jewish others in European memory, in a sense, had a similar or a very common, common uh, template. And the Belgian case, patriotic clause actually excluded Jews from the compensation uh, uh, project. And also German opinion poll in Germany and CDU, both CDU and KPD uh, stood against the uh, compensation and also communist Eastern Europe, in a sense, they, so I think that of course there are differences, but in a sense, both Western Europe and uh, Eastern Europe, till the certain moment, they shared a certain similar attitude towards the uh, coming to terms with the past of Second World War in regard to Jewish others. And then these sort of things can be uh, still found, this opinion for Poland, it was uh, 2005, so suffering of Polish nation uh, is prioritized over the suffering of other uh, nationalities such as Jews. So still uh, the Auschwitz or Auschwitz uh, reminded the Poles and 30-70% reminded uh, their own suffering from uh, Osibiengtim, while 17% you know, reminded Osibiengtim as a Jewish site of Jewish suffering, and 43% is uh, both and so on. This is opinion poll. And, but what is interesting is that the, the, if one has a look at 1999 uh, opinion poll, the younger the more proud of the saving Jews, Jagota, more than September campaign uh, to defend uh, Poland against Nazi invasion. So the younger generation who actually, in a sense, gone through the education about Holocaust and so on, so their attitude towards Holocaust is getting more sensitive and uh, and then non-Jewish others, of course, and there some West Germany, the paragraph one. 175 of Nazi criminal code to punish ho male homosexuality actually continue to the mid 70s, right? And also Aryans punished for violating violating Nazi racial codes for sex, especially women punished for having sexual relations with foreign POWs. They were not the they were outside the compensation plan. And also foreign slave workers' compensation was passed in the Bundestag only in the year 2000. And the communist sympathizers still they are outside the uh, compensation, and POW returnees they had been always under suspicion of uh, you know being renegades and so on. So and the uh, Sintian Romas and the compensation plan for Sintian Romas was still different, and so-called all socials, right? Uh, even they some of them was terrorized by Nazis, but compensation for those all socials has very rarely uh, uh, mentioned. So in this sense, these uh, Jewish others and non-Jewish others are totally, uh, uh, how can I say, certain uh, remained outside this compensation plan. You know, similar thing can be found in East Asia. For example, the comfort women case, everyone knew that. Many a Korean volunteer to the Japanese Imperial Army, they knew the, the station of comfort women because they use this. But nobody talked of this when the comfort woman, uh, Kim Ak Soon, just confessed the, uh, the, uh, her own the experience in 1991, 1992, and still Korean male nationalists were really angry at that. How on earth could these Japanese bad guys, right, sexually exploit our innocent Korean girls? But Actually, if you have a look at Indonesian case, Patavian court immediately after the Second World War, so Dutch, uh, Dutch court actually punished Japanese officials who were responsible for comfort to women, of uh, Dutch women. But it is not about the, uh, uh, the court's decision was not about the women's right, but this is about the racial transgression. For example, how on earth can those yellow Japanese guys exploit sexually our white women. So I think that the Batavian court's orientation towards the comfort of women was very much based on the, on the uh, punishment for the guys who transgressed racial, racial boundaries. So, in, and also in the Japanese, even victimhood, 
So actually, Hiroshima and Nagasaki are all totally Chinese. Chinese means Korean, Korean Japanese who were forced to emigrate to Japan during the Japanese colonial war. And the Taiwanese, Okinawans, all other nationalist nationalities were totally excluded from the, uh, the discourse on the A-bomb uh, victims. But this uh, nationalization of victims can be most recently found in the baby bushes. Uh, the address to commemorate the victims by the September 11. One third of victims in the, these two in terror were non-American nationals who worked as janitors, right, and waiters and waitresses. One third of those victims were not American citizens, but in Bush's address, the victims by the September 11 attack was American, exclusively Americans. So this sort of nationalization of victims can be recurrently found even today's contemporary politics uh, in regard to terrorism and so on and so on. Okay, and then this is um, um, certain in the historical discourses in the uh, Eastern Europe, especially in Poland, one can find ethnic nationalism, primordialist conception of nation is predominant. And it is related, oh my god, okay. So this is uh, uh, the, um, uh, how can I say, yes, uh, the Greenewald and the 1960s, uh, the Polish history education things, and Helishi and Kiewicz, Ogunimi, Miechem. I think this is, rep uh, this is I think this is Sienkiewicz, uh, this uh, certain cultural, cultural understanding of this past is very much closely related with the Polish opinions on the Bowin, it's a massacre in Volhynia, and usually also Polish victims are prioritized in the Polish uh, the public opinion. So this is same of this Gemeinschaft capitalism, actually, I think the, uh, the really existing socialist ideologies is full of metaphors of uh, Gemeinschaft capitalism. It was not about socialism, but capitalism, which is differently uh, interpreted in terms of Gemeinschaft instead of Gesellschaft. And Red Coat historiography is terrible nationalist historiography, simply. So in a sense, this Red Coat historiography and the GMA of Ziskarna Drangna Westen is an, as an alternative against the Drangna Hosten can be found in the Polish archaeology media after the Second World War. A post-1956 party historiography is simply is full of schizophrenia, schizophrenia between internationalism and nationalism, and the struggle against national nihilism, cosmopolitanism, is quite uh, prevalent. And very funny term of objective patriotism you can find in Spolavak in 1970 discussion because objective capital no patriotism is a term coined by Alexander Kohansky to defend internationalist wing of the SKP Earth against the attack by the nationalist communists. They were not patriots subjectively, but objectively they were patriotic. They was a term of objective uh, patriotism, but this sort of very weird and strange uh, phrasing you can find in, in the 1960s and 1970s Red Coat history. So I don't see any fundamental differences between a red coat party historiography and anti-communist nationalist historiography, especially in terms of discourses, epistemology. Of course, politically they are very sharp opponents, but in a way of the understanding their past is uh, not that different. And so anti-communist historiography in a sense, uh, you know, different idioms they just reiterate the epistemology that has been prevalent in the communist history graph. So after the fall, we can find, so how many, how many communist historians went to the camp of the, uh, the Catholic cardinals and they became the advisors of the cardinals? This sort of, how can I say, sort of personal differentiation or transposition after the, sec after the fall of Berlin Wall, we can find quite often, but I don't think this is just a result of careerism. In a sense, they you know, got together. So if you have a look at the uh, Korean Peninsula, ultra-right-wing historiography in South Korea, 
and party historiography in North Korea, they are simply the same. So, but this is not the, not the paradoxical or ironical coincidence. It's like, uh, you know, 1960s, 70s Polish history, if you can find this uh, convergence of the uh, ultra right wing nationalist history and party history. Yes, so. And Eurocentrism, yes. I found today this uh, Polish, uh, Polish East and Orientalism, it was just published two, three years ago. And then when I have a look at this, uh, Main Korans of Polish historiography, especially on the border zone and borderland, I think this is a sort of, how can I say, Eurocentrism uh, reinterpreted in the Polish version. I mean, yes, Jan Sobieski as a savior of Western civilization and Stalin Stasic as Polish Enlightenment, and also Marxist John de You know, you have a look at the Witold Kulas, uh, the analysis mm -hmm. of medieval history of, of, of Poland and the medieval uh, Eastern Europe, you can find it is a typical, typical John the Back. But just the Leninist term of Prussian path, in a sense, is uh, leads people to the understanding their own past in the Marxist, with the Marxist idioms, but it's a typical reiteration of German John the Back. And then, so this is also the, oops, oh, sorry. Okay, then the, this Eurocentrism can be found in the today's history textbooks. Without any reservation, they say Eurocentrism is inevitable and it's necessary in this sense, and Poland has been a part of the West. Thus, what happened within the orbit of Western civilization is most important purpose. And the, this, uh, you, you know, this. so Polish red orientalism and social imperialism can be found in the Pepe's and STKP, or especially their uh, the attitude <coughs> towards the Lithuanians, the Belarusians, and Ukrainians. But actually, the same attitude can be found among the activists or theoreticians of SPD. So SPD's you know, attitude towards Poland is almost the same Polish socialist attitude towards uh, their neighbors, Ukrainians and Belarusians. So it's a red orientalism and social imperialism can be found even in Rosa Luxemburg. She has uh, always contemptuously called Leninism as Tatar Marxism. And even the Clara Zetkin, when she was really angry at Karl Radek, though she knew that Karl Radek was a Polish Jew, she always called in the private letter, oh, this Turkestan, this Turkestan. This is, uh, you know, simple. And also, I like this, uh, some, yeah, too many. And Alexander Watt is my favorite literary critic in Poland. But if you read his uh, memoir, his dialogue with Chesa uh, Miłosz, Every two pages you can find, oh, this Asiatic face beat me, they tortured me. It means uh, NKVD, the, this, uh, the uh, Soviet Union, Russian NKVD, she was tortured, he was tortured in the prison of NKVD during the Second World War. But every two pages, this so-called Marxist critic had talked about this Asiatic faces and so Mongol-like people and something like that. So, this is a sort of, how can I say, sort of module or template that can be found among the books. Okay, I stop and I will come back to, uh, to the third of Q&A. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Okay, the next speaker is Bartholomew Kozestan, and he is a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Roklo, a graduate of political science at the University of Roklo and the Universite Libre de Bruxelles. Um, and his research interests are connected with issues of postmodern social political thought as well as cultural memory, identity, anthropology of everyday life and post-colonialism with an emphasis on the post-Soviet sphere, the Caucasus and Central and Eastern Europe. So I'll try to get your PowerPoint up. Can you pass that? Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the myth and the imagination in the memory and history discourses in Armenia and Georgia. And actually, putting uh, Georgia and Armenia together, uh, 
it's kind of provocative because uh, I was trying to just uh, establish some uh, region of memory and then check it out whether actually this region of memory, uh, which can combine these two Christian, uh, what is important nations of the South Caucasus, can really go uh, together. Uh, we'll try to do that uh, with the rethinking or rewriting the theory uh, of uh, Dipesh Chakrabarti and other post-colonial thinkers uh, in different circumstances. I mean, the question is. Uh, why in the post-Soviet or post-socialist world we not especially like uh, the post, uh, post-colonialism? Uh, some works obviously were written already, but uh, still, my, uh, my idea is that actually this, uh, this approach is not especially liked uh, in this uh, political sphere. Uh, so let's start with this uh, general uh, overview. So um, the point from which we are beginning is the Thoma theorem. So if you are saying that if man defines the situation as real, they are real in their consequences and this is how the memory is created in this region. So it's not important what uh, really happened in the past. It's not important how it's really remembered, but the question is how it's reconstructed in the, in the structure. So we have to believe what is said to us, and we have to believe it's uh, uh, what was created and imagined after all. Uh, Later on, I will go to the Chakrabarti, who was saying that the imagination uh, does not equal the false. And uh, this is the very important manner for the uh, analysis of the memory in this uh, geographical region. So from this, we are going to new unexpected situations, so political situation, which is obviously the collapse of USSR, which requires to creating the new uh, discourse about the past in both newly awakened nations uh, in Georgia and in Armenia. Uh, in the same time, uh, even if we were expecting, let's say, in the broadly understood West, that actually all the previous Second World countries, uh, they are going to head directly in the First World, they are going to take this neoliberal uh, point of view in the economy and on the culture. Uh, in the South Caucasus, uh, it is rather rejected. So uh, the, post-modernity, the, the postmodernity didn't appear, so some kind of endemic memory discourse, I would say, some breach between the East and the West. Uh, as a memory discus was created. Uh, in effect of that, uh, of this deep need to rebuild the nation and states in very harsh times, um, it was also important to reject dependent systems of knowledge. So this dependent system of knowledge was obviously the dialectic Marxism, and that's the most important element, uh, which is causing that actually uh, we don't like, especially post-colonialism in the post-Soviet sphere. And then these newly created power of knowledge systems, which are very nationalistic and irredentic, and they appear Earlier, they didn't appear with the beginning with the collapse of USSR, but earlier, uh, these newly created, imagined communities there they caused the awakening of the irredentism and after all the regional conflicts, which are very strongly stuck in the uh, collective memory uh, in the South Caucasus. Uh, so, if we will go to the terminological letter of meanings, I call it like this way, uh, but it's just metaphorical. So, uh, we got like many distinctions, many uh, bipolar. Um, uh, bipolar elements of this. So the f- what one thing, we got the memory in history, and later on I'm going to talk how this distinction is realized in South Caucasus, then the spoken and unspoken elements of discourse. So we got like a narrative, uh, we got the narrative version, and on the other hand we got the unspoken element of this discourse. So what we can see in the visual, um, in the visual uh, base. Uh, and the myth and imagination, then nation and ethnos, rethinking and representation and recreation and reproduction of the artifacts who are helping to um, create the new um, new discourses. Uh, let's ask the question how the post-colonialism meets post-Soviet and post-socialism, or whether it's actually possible to uh, recreate this uh, theory, uh, rewrite this theory in the different regional uh, circumstances. So uh, it's obvious that in the transitional period it's very important to create own myths and imaginations to uh, just consolidate the newly created community. And the South Caucasus, as I said, like a political situation, harsh political situation, really required strong usage of the methodology and methodology and, uh, um, and imaginations. Uh, then the question which is appearing is again we are going back to the uh, theorem. So post-imperial awakening attempts to reconstruct the memory even if it's not fully based on the reality because the question is what is the reality? We have to reject like 200 years of uh, uh, history uh, in the South Caucasus uh, but on the other hand we have to prove that we can exist separately. Uh, 
uh, in compared to our uh, in compared to our neighbors with which we are in conflict. Uh, and because of that, we got like a memory discussion in traditional and postmodern context, uh, going back this creation of uh, uh, nations, nation building processes, and state building processes. They are based mainly on traditional values. So uh, Georgians and Armenians, they are going back to the 19th century. They are using the categories uh, which created the uh, understanding of nations in 19th century Europe at the beginning of uh, 20th century. And another uh, element of uh, that discuss is the contractual history. So now we are going uh, precisely to uh, Chakrabarti. So contractual history, so some kind of Marxist idea uh, is so going uh, against the dialectism, so the version of the history, this contractual history, which was brought by the colonizer, so by imperial, uh, by imperial Lush, Russia. Another element of this discourse is difference between the formal change and mental change. Uh, the South Caucasus, difference between the professional historians and myth bearers, uh, difference between those who are bringing us the history, who are re uh, researching over the history, and those who are just bearing the mess. There's really unclear, and I would say that it's uh, historians very often, they are just uh, used by the state propaganda to spread the official version of the, uh, the history which is based on the myth and the imaginations. Uh, so what does it mean to reject the colonial contractual history? Uh, Soviet experience in both in Georgia and Armenia created some kind of common or almost, uh, maybe not almost identical, memory history discourse. Uh, when the Russian came to the Caucasus, uh, they said, OK, we brought you the progressive dialectical discourse. Now we are heading to the future. Uh, you're going to develop well within our structures. Uh, but at the same moment, when um, the discourse uh, of the Soviet Union in the Caucasus looked like um I look like that the discourse of the progress, the strong nationalistic movements in different countries uh, spread, it, especially in the South Caucasus, in the Baltic state, was the, that, the, that, uh, that was observable. Uh, so the colonialism in the context of the South Caucasus is not only descriptive or academic, it's also the political, uh, it's also the political uh, issue. So uh, how is that possible to use the theories uh, of post-coloniality, which are very strongly based on Marxist-Leninism in the system which are actually rejected this way of understanding the social reality uh, a few years uh, ago. And uh, like, like I said, the collapse of Soviet Union uh, expect, uh, expect also changes on the level of politics, on the level of transpirations and uh, transitions. That caused the awakening of the irredentism, I mean like increasing of irredentism because this irredentism existed uh, during the Soviet Union uh, as well. And then we are going to the hypothesis that this comparative perspective provokes the hypothesis this is that the post-colonial rejection of contractual history in the memory is strongly connected with mythological and uh, I'm sorry I didn't change it. Okay, comparative uh, mythological and imaginary restriction of ideas of nation and statehood. Uh, so when the frozen conflict appeared in the South Caucasus at the beginning of the 90s, this frozen conflict started to be like very important elements of a uh, mm, uh, collective uh, memory. So three different discourses, the individual the memory discourse, collective memory discourse, they're combined somehow with the official state-driven uh, discourse. Uh, so we have to define what this doesn't mean, the politics and the political, what is very important there. Because uh, the rejection of a representatism in the South Caucasus caused that actually uh, the positive understanding of the political, of existence in the political, uh, brought from the Hannah Arendt, like the liberative freedom, was, was rejected. So the uh, identities in the South Caucasus were very strongly based on the antagonism of conflict. Like, uh, so we have to recall it's uh, Chantal Mouffe and, uh, and Carl Schmitt and their understanding of the political. And the difference between the politics, so the politics existent on the um, level of institutions and the political, so existence of the human being in the, po in the politics, uh, it's also very unclear, like a difference between the history uh, and memory. Uh, which is the re rejection of this Halvaxian uh, uh, distinction. Uh, what is the connection between the nation building and uh, imagination? Like I said, Chakrabarti was writing about India that imagination is not equal to false. So the same thing might be uh, said about the South uh, Caucasus. Uh, any element that cannot be treated like, uh, cannot be judged. 
we cannot say objectively that using these imaginations, um, it's something which is uh, doing bad things to the, to, 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 to the history, because that was the let's say, historical requirement in this, uh, in this moment. How it's realized? Uh, there are symbols which are visible every day. This is the state-driven memory, which automatically repeat the element of the discourse identity consolidate collective memory. So all the monuments constructed, uh, all the representation of the past, which appeared after 1991, they got like a precise uh, purpose. So they were erected to just implemented this version, official version of the, uh, of the, of the memory. Uh, and uh, they are influencing on the collective memory as well and otherwise. On the narrative level, I would say that the um, Georgians and Romanian discourses about nationalists, they, reject, they postulate this rejection of Eurocentric perspective on nation and uh, identity. So that's what I said about the positive, positive reflection on the political. Uh, there is from uh, Hannah Arendt is not realized there. Everything what we are talking about, the memory and identity, is strongly based on the conflict of antagonism. So we got the Armenians who are constructing their identity in compared to Turks and the Azerbaijanis. We got the Abhazin who are just talking about themselves, uh, not in positive way that we are like we are because we are Abhazin, but we are Abhazins because we are not Georgians. We are self citizens because we are not Georgians and, uh, and so on, and in Azerbaijani case is similar. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the way how the past is presented in the public space, uh, I would say it's like very modernistic and now we are going back again to this Europocentric 19th century ideas of uh, expressing identity on everyday level. So all the monuments which I will show you in the moment, um, they are made in a very modernistic way and they are representing the strongly nationalistic uh, version of uh, representation of uh, identity and ethnicity. Uh, there are some discursive common ground for both of these countries, but as I said, it's just a provocative because uh, uh, we can treat Georgia and Armenia as ca some kind of region of memory, but there are too much differences which have to be expressed um, between those two countries to say this is precisely uh, one mnemonic uh, region. Uh, but on the one hand, we, have, we can say in the context of post-coloniality, uh, the strong myth and imagination of being first Christian nations. So what happened to these first Christian nations which had like a huge statehoods in the medieval time? Uh, then suddenly, because of some external factors, uh, they started to be dependent peripheria to barbaric Russia or barbaric Ottoman Empire in the case of, uh, of Armenians. Uh, so this rejection uh, is then that actually barbaric Russia came and they took our land, so we have to recreate our identity, rejecting this past. But on the other hand, contractual history taken from the Chakrabarti was brought actually to Georgia and to Armenia uh, by Russian historians. So we have some kind of paradox in that. Uh, and then we got this myth of being the bridge between the East and West. So then we have to ask the question, where in this bridge between the East and West is another country within the South Caucasus, Azerbaijan? And there is no answer for that uh, within, this, within this scope. Then we are going back to the idea of creating themselves in the opposite, on the antagonist and conflict. So in the case of Armenia, it's anti turkins and this goes about the genocide, which was later on taken as a, one of the important elements to break out of the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. And in the case of Georgia, uh, recently started recalling of the short history of Georgian Democratic Republic between 1918 and 1921. Even these three years between the imperial period and then Soviet period, um, is used as a moment which is showing that, okay, we had our own statehood in the meantime, so we were basically occupied, and everything what happened during the Soviet time and imperial time uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't good for us, wasn't uh, especially developing. Uh, and then the common experience of frozen conflicts, even though the both of these frozen ethno-political conflicts are really different from uh, each other, um, they are strongly influencing on the identity uh, and memory. Uh, as well.
And uh, what does it mean, uh, the clash of discourses in the visual space? So, uh, first of all, uh, during this process of recreation based on the myths of the imagination, we got like a three different meaning of representation, like from the, from, uh, from Ricard. So first meaning, uh, so reference for the historian is not important for us. The most important element of the representation in this meaning is the to show in the public again what was forbidden in the public before. So recall the memory which was before. So in the case of Armenia, a very important element was the genocide, which, which was existing only, uh, which is existing only on the collective memory level. Until 1965, it was not possible in Armenia uh, to talk about the genocide. After 1965, when the huge mass protest in Yerevan took place, uh, this collective uh, level uh, discussion and representation of the genocide started to be more official, started to be researched by historians. But after 50 years of complete silence, that was already political question. So historians and myth bearers, they were developing the, con uh, the, the narratives about the uh, genocide in the similar way. In the case of Georgia, it's the case of uh, GDR. So something would not, was not existing in the Soviet history uh, started to be representing again. And the second understanding of the uh, representation, so uh, how we are presenting the past on the cultural level. So this representation this possibility to have a new representations uh, give, the, give an impulse to rethink the past in the conflictual shape about which I was talking uh, already. I've got like a four minutes, so I will go uh, to the uh, examples. So let's start with this public uh, space representation of rejection. So here we can see the hero square in Tbilisi. Uh, it's a huge statue uh, in the one of the most important uh, squares, in the one biggest squares in the Tbilisi. And this is a commemoration of the Georgian victims of the conflicts at the beginning of 19th in South Ossetia uh, in Abkhazia. And when you want to cross the police from the west to the east or from the east to the west, you have to cross that. So uh, this is experience of every day. This is ethnicity which is uh, created on everyday level because when you are crossing that every day you are seeing the soldiers standing in front of this monument. You are seeing this huge statue and you are thinking what happened before. So these frozen conflicts are still used by the state uh, agents to uh, represent somehow uh, the memory of the uh, past. Here is another example. Uh, I especially like this on the right. It's just a part of the uh, statue, but this is Liberty Square or Freedom Square, Tavisu Pleba Moedani in Tbilisi. This is the statue of St. George, who is a patron of Georgia. And what is interesting nowadays, this statue is standing uh, in the uh, Freedom Square of Tbilisi. But before, in the same place, was standing the Lenin statue. And this, uh, this, this square was called Leninska La so uh, Lenin Square. Uh, so this is like how the one memory and how the one moment of the history is replaced by the another one. And on the left, we got the war memorial in Gori, which was uh, established in Gori uh, after the August War uh, in 2008. Uh, now we are going to the conflict zones. On the le left, you can see the glory part in Sukhumi. So similar representation like in Tbilisi, by made by Abkhazians. So we are heading to Sukhumi, which is completely destroyed city. During the last 20 years, nothing changed there. So we can really see the Soviet world. And in the middle of the city, we got like perfectly done park in which the, the monuments of the uh, soldiers who died during the, uh, the war are buried. And this is the most important place in the city. It's similar case like in Tbilisi. When you have, want to cross from the one side of the city to the another one, you have to cross this place. So that's how the state, that's how the state propaganda is trying to introduce this memory, recreated memory on the citizens. And on the right, we got the village bank and license uh, in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and license place from the Agdam. Agdam is, uh, was the city um, uh, with the majority of Azerbaijanis living in. Um, and this license, uh, nowadays, like city completely abandoned and there's ju just shootings between Armenian and Azerbaijanis there. Um, and th in this small village in the mountains somewhere, where nothing except the wall where all of those uh, all of those license plates are and they are reminding the conflict every day I'm calling the this frozen conflict zones in South Caucasus this post-COVID also in uh, Transistria uh, the places where you got uh, 
permanent state of instability. And this kind of monuments, like the Glory Park in Suhumi or this license plates wall, they are helping to keep some kind of idea of stability, of belonging to some uh, community. Then we got the rejection of dependent system of knowledge. So on the left, the National Museum in Suhumi, and on the right, Georgian National Museum. So we can start to talk about the elements of the history which were forbidden. Oh. Ah, yeah, sure. The, the, I mean, the license plates, there is a, there is a city, Agdam, in Nagorno-Karabakh. And uh, this city was occupied mainly by, by Azerbaijanis. Now this is completely abandoned. So those license plates are from the cars. Uh, from this city, someone gathered all of those uh, license plates uh, in Agdam, brought it to this village, and just made some kind of sculpture of commemoration out of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like the city is completely demolished. You know, yeah. Uh, so we got like this dependent systems of knowledge. So we got the elements of discourse which were forbidden before. On the right, the uh, element from the uh, from the Georgian National Museum, when which was made a uh, um, uh, big exhibition about the participation of the Georgian soldiers in the Second World War. So on the one hand, we had the Georgians who were fighting in the Red Army, uh, and they are called the heroes of the Soviet Union, the heroes of Georgia, and liberators as well. But on the other hand, we had the Georgians who were collaborating with Hitler, looking for the possibility to liberate. Georgia from the Soviet power, and they are called freedom fighters. And on the left, we've got the National Museum in Sohumi, where the past can be showed, like colonization of Abkhazin made by Georgians. Uh, this is another example of this uh, representation. So Genocide Museum and Memorial Yerevan, established in 1965 uh, and, changed late, uh, and changed later. I can say more words about that later, because my time is gone already. So just la last picture. And this is very important element, the Georgian National Museum and Soviet Occupation Exhibition, done after 2004, after uh, Mikhail Saakashvili took a power uh, in Georgia. Uh, and and we can see that this period in the Georgian history, like a 70 years, was completely uh, derived from the discus. So we got like a 70 years, which are clearly cold occupations. So uh, in, we can just see the bad examples, the just bad examples of what's happening in those times. There is no single artifact which is showing that some kind of progress happened uh, in this period of uh, uh, history. This is another example of the uh, everyday uh, representation of ethnicity. Uh, in conflict zone areas, uh, and in the end, I just wanted to show scantering examples. So, uh, conflict zone zones areas, the status of uh, Lenin everywhere, nostalgia, and not the uh, lack of uh, will to uh, demolish those examples, and Georgia, which is strongly on the uh, let's so say we'll have to finish very soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the last slide, Thank but you. that was a question, so I should have like an additional minute, I guess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I didn't uh, authorize the question. <laughs> so, underground printing house museum in Tbilisi, uh, where actually this memory about the past is completely kept and it's completely country example to how the uh, Georgian authorities they are representing the past. And another, the most famous example of so the Stalin's museum, so where uh, comrade Stalin was born. Uh, I was just make I, I was making the experimental uh, ethnographic research. Then I was interviewing uh, uh, the. Uh, interviewing the um, guys in this museum. And actually, uh, even if the official narrative about the museum was that we are showing that to remember the past to not repeat that, those guys, they are still glorifying the comrade Stalin uh, still. So that is an example of the counter memory. Uh, so I'm not going to take more time. So thank you very much. And thank you. I can see you've got a lot more interesting material. Um, Okay, we'd like to move on to the next speech speaker, who is Malhas Toria, who is Associate Professor and Director of the newly established Memory Studies Centre in the Caucasus at um, Ilya State University. And his research interests... Do you sit down there? Which one? 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 Okay. Um, yes, and his um, research focuses on um, memory politics in the formation of conflicting identities, memories of internally displaced communities from the conflict zone in Georgia, imperial legacies, ethnic boundaries, and the politics of exclusion in Georgia and post-socialist space. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, in post-Soviet uh, era, uh, redefining and 
rebordering of uh, Georgia's location within new global so-called uh, civilizational context, that is to say, rejoining of Europe uh, was uh, kind of a key strategy of overcoming Soviet legacies uh, and uh, one of the main goals of Georgian governing elites in this period, since they gaining the independence. Uh, so the overcoming uh, imperial legacies um, meant also decolonization of uh, collective memory. That is to portray the uh, history of Soviet Georgia as uh, a period of Russian occupation. Uh, so uh, we can say that uh, indeed the perception and representation of uh, uh, Russia as an historical regressor and an occupier is one of the main and most important paradigm which serves as a strategy of strengthening Georgian national identity. Uh, and justification of the current uh, geopolitical and or civilizational uh, aspirations. Okay. <clears throat> My one minute is gone. Okay, and um, uh, so, uh, but this kind of new repositioning uh, during the post-Soviet period uh, caused controversies uh, and several ways of escalations of, between uh, former imperial core Russia and ethnic minorities within Georgia, uh, you know, mainly uh, Abkhazians and South Ossetians. Uh, 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 in this connection, Abkhazians uh, always were against moving um, away from Moscow's embrace, let's say in this way, since they consider themselves as a kind of part of uh, this uh, uh, Soviet or post-Soviet cultural uh, space uh, and political space too. Uh, at the first glance, in Abkhazian historical discourse, uh, controversial historical events uh, are combined, mixed, uh, or integrated into into single and mono perspective uh, uh, narrative that stress on positive experience of uh, Abkhazian-Russian relationships throughout the history. Uh, and, uh, which means that they sign the, the painful history of mass, deport, mass deportation of ethnic Abkhazians and Circassians uh, during the Tsarist period to the Ottoman Empire, which is called Muhajirstvo in Abkhazian history. On the other hand, the kind of positive experience of living together with ethnic Georgians uh, in, um, in Abkhazia region is completely forgotten or silenced in order to kind of maintain conflicting identities in the current period. Uh, uh, in a certain sense, we can say that these arguments uh, uh, are grounded on imperial legacies such as Soviet uh, administration division, uh, generally um, uh, Soviet national uh, Nationalities policy, which is called Korinizatsia, uh, 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 established ethno territorial uh, division based on so called hierarchical uh, nationalism, uh, and um, uh, uh, Soviet uh, Bolsheviks were committed to recognize uh, uh, language based cultural groups. Uh, as a uh, uh, and uh, and they gave autonomies uh, the, of uh, to these people within this of federal state state uh, lately uh, in Georgian case uh, this autonomy structures in Abkhazia served as a main legal uh, institutions of irredentist demands uh, and uh, uh, this was kind of a uh, uh, place to uh, then follow this kind of war of uh, laws, which we will refer to in the, uh, lately. Uh, <clears throat> so let's touch the uh, political context of the conflict. Uh, 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 during the Soviet period, the uh, uh, relationship between Georgians and Abkhazians uh, had not been free of tension. Uh, and uh, in several times, um, uh, uh, local Abkhazian red intelligentsia and uh, high-ranking uh, communist party officials, or part of them, uh, 
periodically uh, uh, demanded uh, uh, to join uh, Abkhazia into the Russian uh, Socialist Federal Republic. Yeah, US, uh, um, but uh, uh, in, during the Soviet time, um, um, uh, uh, Soviet government refused, rejected this uh, demand, but they gave them some kind of uh, um, uh, new rights, in, um, for example, television, or is they established university, Abkhazian State University in, in Sukhumi, and, and, and so on. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, in, uh, 90, in 1989, the first intercommunal clashes appeared, but then conflict did not start because both Abkhazians and Georgians were not prepared for this in military way. And, um, uh, but uh, uh, the law, the war of law, I, I was, I, I referred uh, uh, in, in 1990s, the, uh, uh, Abkhazia. Um, Supreme Soviet of local Abkhazia Repu uh, Autonomous Republic declared unilateral um, uh, uh, declaration that, uh, that again demanded joining uh, uh, Soviet Union as a different socialist republic, free of uh, socialist republic of Georgia. Uh, but uh, uh, this decision immediately was denounced by the Georgian Supreme uh, Soviet, uh, uh, and uh, in the post-Soviet period, or nearly post-Soviet period, when first Georgian President Sviatgam Sakhordia was elected, uh, there was a, a, a agreement, a compromise uh, on the power sharing issue, and Abkhazia, uh, Abkhazians uh, received more seats in, in the Supreme Soviet uh, than the representative of the Georgians, who were a majority at the time. Uh, in the in the Abkhazia, in the Abkhazia region, um, uh, Georgians uh, after that, when Kamsakhurtia was ousted of the uh, presidency, uh, Georgian Soviet restored the the GDR constitution, which Barton was referring, and uh, there was Abkhazia mentioned in this first constitution, and Abkhazians, on, on the other hand, restored um, the first draft of Bolshevik uh, constitution of uh, Soviet Republic of Abkhazia, which was short-lived, and Stalin then again integrated Abkhazia within the Georgian Socialist Republic. Uh, but after that, in um, 1992, the first, uh, when uh, Georgian National Guard entered Abkhazia in order to um, 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 uh, guard uh, the uh, railway station, uh, they, they uh, um, appeared, f the, f the conflict was uh, triggered. Um, and in September 1993, Abkhazians seized Sukhumi uh, again, and the uh, 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 majority of population of Abkhazia were forced uh, to, to, to flee from the, from the region. So, uh, uh, um, yeah. Now I would like to refer to this national narrative template uh, and how the conflict is represented in the, in the Georgian national narrative. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the crucial aspects of the contemporary Georgian national narrative is the representation of the Georgian Abkhazian conflict as the explosion of the mines planted by Russia in order to weaken Georgia as a, and frustrate any attempts to escape from Russian domination. Uh, we can refer to the James Works uh, uh, theory uh, of narrative template, uh, and uh, uh, this author with um, uh, the Georgian colleague proposed kind of Georgian narrative template. Uh, and uh, we can see that uh, within this narrative, uh, Georgia exists as a small independent nation, uh, which uh, with territorial integrity and the prelicious crossroads of the East and West, uh, and uh, then Georgia was invaded by a powerful enemy, outside, uh, external power, uh, and it was in incorporated into a larger empire. Um, and uh, the 
happy end of this narrative template is that uh, Georgia regains the independence and reestablishes European uh, uh, style democracy again. Uh, so this is the main uh, key elements of this kind of Georgian narrative templates. Uh, uh, this, you can see this. Okay. Uh, so how uh, I I want again so touch on the, the representation representation of the Russia. So uh, Russia is viewed as a historical and civilizational uh, conf uh, uh, enemy, and the uh, confrontation with this uh, power is uh, viewed as a confrontation between a democratic country and the barbarian great power, like a confrontation uh, uh, or battle between David and Goliath. This is kind of a key metaphor we can use. Uh, so this template is used to interpret uh, continuing uh, confrontations with Russia beginning uh, uh, imperial annexation uh, of Georgia in, in 19th century, and then uh, uh, occupation by the Red Army in 1921, uh, and then the August War in 2008. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Um, what, what about this uh, kind of uh, minority issues within this narrative? So. Uh, uh, the minority issues always used by Russia, according to Znarit template, as a casus belli to invade the country. So, uh, Mikhail Saakashvili, the former president of uh, uh, Georgia, uh, always used this and stressed always this issue in his political speeches. Uh, and, uh, for example, he, he, uh, he mentioned that uh, in 1921, the issues of so-called national minorities were seen as a casus belli, and Bolsheviks occupied the first democratic republic of Georgia. Today, Russia's actions can be characterized as a creeping annexation and the prelude of a real occupation. Uh, uh, and this kind of... Uh, uh, parallels of uh, allegorical typologies, Legov uh, uh, pointed in, in his in, uh, in his book, uh, was intensified during uh, after the so-called Rose Revolution and uh, during the presidency of Mikhail Saakashvili, and uh, the general Rose Revolution was perceived uh, uh, as a new time one each uh, experiments can change the nature of society. Uh, Georgia was represented as a, represented as a laboratory for reforms and um, of course change direct towards the uh, and direction toward Georgia's natural European family. So this is a quote from uh, uh, president's speech again, uh, we, when he meets uh, with French President Nicolas Sarkozy uh, in Tbilisi, and uh, he made uh, also a lot of uh, reference to this European roots of Georgian culture, Georgian people, and uh, permanent battle for, for this aspiration within this uh, uh, barbaric uh, uh, North uh, dark uh, empire. This, this, this was the main main characteristic of this uh, the, this speech. Uh, so after the Russian Georgian War, what's what's happened in this conflict zone in, uh, and in terms of this uh, geopolitical repositioning, both in Georgia and both within this uh, breakaway region of Abkhazia, uh, Russia, uh, as you are aware, recognized independence of this uh, region uh, um, and uh, leg legitimized the, uh, the, its present military presence in Abkhazia, uh, reached bilateral defense and border protection agreements with Sukhumi. Um, uh, and uh, Georgia, on the other hand, passed uh, the law on occupied territories. Uh, and uh, according to this uh, law, uh, heavy penalties on any individual organization or a corporation with contracts in occupied Abkhazia were placed. Uh, also, uh, 
the de facto authorities were viewed as an illegal, as illegal satellite regimes of Russia. Uh, and uh, this law criminalizes any attempts to enter Abkhazia and South Ossetia uh, from Russia or through Russia and any economic activity in this, in this region. So if you are going as a scholar to the Abkhazia region, you have to pass Georgian border and then you're welcome there. Okay, I'll, I'll finish one. Um, uh, for example, uh, when I met uh, one scholar in New York uh, City, he complained me as I was uh, you know, responsible for this that Georgian government don't issue uh, doesn't issue a visa for him because he crossed this border from Russia. So what what could I do uh, about this? <laughs> um, uh, and uh, there is a uh, new challenges for Georgian government today. This is the so-called Russian-Abkhazian agreement, which uh, as a, uh, which. Uh, intensifies these close relationships with Russia. And uh, according to Dieter Boden, which was uh, representative of international organization uh, uh, to the uh, conflict zone in uh, Abkhazia, he, he mentioned that uh, one might argue that uh, relations are laid uh, down in the agreement that already characterizing reality on the ground such as monitoring of the current border with Georgia. However, the new agreement goes beyond that, especially with regard to its uh, provisions of internal and external security, but also Abkhazia's obligations concerning foreign policy uh, uh, coordination. Uh, so uh, generally, it, I, I will conclude now. Uh, there is a lot of discussions within Abkhazian society that uh, this agreement is a threat for their independence. But uh, anyway, this realization of this uh, agreement is going on steadily and increasingly, and Russia's influence is increasing in, the, in this region. So how can we, can we put this case of geopolitical reposition in, in, in a post-colonial um, context? Uh, uh, it is difficult uh, because the Soviet case is completely different of British or French domination in, uh, in, uh, in throughout the world uh, because uh, the Bolsheviks uh, followed with the extraordinary nationalities policy, uh, which, which sometimes was called as an affirmative uh, action empire uh, when uh, these national uh, markers of national identities were stressed and even engineered in some parts of Soviet Union. Um, uh, but anyway, in political propaganda and in official political discourse in Georgia, especially this uh, term of neocolonialism or uh, imperial wars against uh, uh, free will of Georgia is still permits all aspects of not just political life, but also the social level and school curricula and so on and so on. And uh, it seems that within this current situation and uh, uh, of, of Georgia-Russia relationships, it will continue, I don't know, uh, at least decades, decades. Um, uh, so thank you so much for your attention. Now it works. Okay. Thank you very much for your wonderful and inspiring talks. They were very rich in detail, so I would just pick up a few lines of that what you said. Well, I have to admit the two of them I had only in PowerPoint, so I if I'm not subtle enough, please forgive me. Uh, also, some ideas I had before were already solved by you when you were talking, so, so I will skip, uh, skip, uh, skip that part. Uh, but Ji Hyun uh, presentation was actually richer than that what you could see today, and I will also refer to some ideas you had. Uh, you had you did not uh, had enough time to to explain. I will start with a very detailed comment to, uh, to, to your presentation. In, in my opinion, 
uh, most of textual heritage you enumerated belong to the so-called storage memory, to the Speichergedächtnis, to use the Asman's term. So I would say that they stay passive in the archive and only very few of them are actually activated and belong to the realm of the Funktionsgedächtnis in the working memory. And this active heritage I would see on this first slide of use, which, were, which you called textual heritage one, ethnic nationalist primordialism, and also some of the slides with Eurocentrism. And this might have some explanatory force behind the present discourse and the present developments, but we still need to work on the argument how it how <laughs> how it links. Uh, the other, the, I'm a bit hesitant to bring the by your use of the research polls, especially the one when you mentioned the 1999 results, saying that, well, see, the school, you know, the, the textbook matters. First of all, the, 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 the survey was made 17 years ago, so that's already, that's already a long time. Second, they are not, you know, the, you know, they could mention several things at the same time. So it could be school, obviously, how do you know about the Second World War? I know it from school, but I also know it from film, from family. So it's very difficult to to say how, what is the sense the people uh, make out of it. And, uh, well, the, the most important thing, which I th in a way links these two comments, is if you really look for a narrative template, of the uh, of, of the Polish society, as they do is in, in in Georgian as, as in Georgian case, where actually you would look for it. I mean, that this what you have named was more the historiographical discourse, which, as I said, I I, I, I would claim most of that belongs to the archive. It, mm. It's not activated. The school books are important, but only to certain ex, uh, extents. Films and novels less and less because people read uh, less. They watch very different movies, so we would need to turn to internet, but how to look for the one narrative template in the, in the internet. So it's tricky, it's complicated, I think. So that's the, 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 this is the detail, the detailed ideas I had on listening to your, uh, to your presentation. But now how to bring all your presentation under one roof, that is obviously the post-colonial discourse, which was very, which was more present in the version of the presentation G. Uh, Hyun sent to me, and you, then you have seen it. And well, I, I find the linking post-colonial discourse to the regions of memory idea appealing, because of, it, of its very obvious thing that the post-coloniality post entails referentiality. So it brings the referentiality to the center of attention, even if we focus or stay mainly at the national level, as most of you did, we can very easily see that the nation does not exist without referring to important others, being it minorities or more importantly in the respect you all show to the political powers, um, uh, which in this post-colonial narrative, if you will, were responsible for victimizing the nation. Uh, in the Polish recent history, it would be the Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, and if you push this narrative template back in time, Prussia, Austrian Empire, and Russian empires. So the national identity in, in this sense is the state of being referential or containing references to the outside, outside agents. In most powerful narrative uh, template of the the, the Polish identity simply does not exist without outside oppressors and overcoming uh, this uh, oppression. Uh, mm. And you can see how it hits back to the present. Some of you are very well familiar that the Polish defense minister, Antoni Macierewicz, has recently uh, publicly suggested that the 2010 plane crash in Smolensk uh, was uh, an act of terrorism of the Russian state. 
such referentiality will cause reaction in the case from in this case from Russian who would also somehow position Poland in the discourse obviously in different constellation of their own templates but these are the entanglements on both sides that remain on regional stay, uh, still and not on global or universal level and same in a way holds for Caucasus, so the, it, Mark has recreated Georgian narrative template that is, and it's a quote, used to interpret continuing confrontations with Russia, including the annexation of Georgia at the beginning of the 19th century, the occupation by the Red Army, the support of separatist movement by the Russia, and so on. So. There is this refer refer referentiality to Russia on the one hand and to Europe on the other. So that's one thing. The other thing which is also very interesting in, in this Caucasus, Caucasian cases which are also similar to the, um, to the Eastern European or East Central European historiography is the fact that the Soviet Union is not only the kind of agent of uh, uh, the important other of creating national, uh, national identities in post-1991 period, but that it existed much before. So if you look more closely into what happened in the Soviet period, what you all did, stressing that we all stress that the feature of Soviet system was the ability of the Soviet narrative to function simultaneously with local patterns of remembrance and the fact that already the Soviet policies of regional differences facilitated the development of national distinctions. Uh, and we have a very good books on Ukraine, which also referred already to the Stalinist time as the mm, moment where the Ukrainian identities are, are created challenging Russia imperial discourse, but also drawing on the Russian, let's say, nationalism. Um, and so that would be my general comment. So I think that this region and post-colonial, regions of memory and post-colonial discourse, they, they do work very well, but just grasping the opportunity that we have two Caucasian scholars uh, at, the, uh, at the same table, I will ask you one question which is aside your papers. Uh, how important are Armenians, Georgians and Azerbaijanis for each other on discursive, on discursive and agency level uh, in post-1991 situation when it comes to the politics of memory? And I'm not asking how similar they are because, you know, Everyone is different in a sense, yeah. But how do they refer to each other? Are there some similarities as in, let's say, East Central Europe when we have, I don't know, some efforts to claim that uh, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, they share similar histories, and so, so we can make them into a region of memory by political means because they have some common paths and so, some future agenda which they share. So we have our Visegrad groups, networks of <laughs> remembrance and solidarity, and different agencies who. Uh, claim that there is something common and that there is the politics of, of memory behind that for the future sakes and we can extend it to Romania, Bulgaria and the Baltics from time to time. So that, that's, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll hold those questions for now because we've got about 20 minutes left and I'll collect some more and you can answer together if that's all right. So any questions? Yes, the back first. Microphone. Hang on. Just work for the mic. Sorry. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Um, I would have a question about Georgia and this uh, master narrative about the national history. I want, because you mentioned a couple of times that this was, this was a type of narrative which was fostered, uh, particularly under Saakashvili came to power. He's not in the office anymore. And what I was wondering, this game, political game, um, was it somehow reflected in this nuanced, nuanced development of the national narrative or it didn't, I mean, the fact that Saakashvili was gone didn't change uh, what he uh, created when he once he, he was in the office. Thank you. Thanks. Um, over there, there was a question. Yeah, and then.
Uh, well, thank you very much to all of you. Um, I have a question to Bartłomiej, and actually two. Uh, the first one concerns the concept of Armenia and Georgia um, as the bridge between East and West. Um, you mentioned this is, is this a quite uh, popular concept there, and it seems to me that um, the whole region of Eastern Europe um, has this narrative. I mean, in Poland, this narrative of being the bridge between East and West uh, is very popular too. So I'd like to ask you about the specificity uh, of the Armenian and Georgian case. And the second question concerns the monuments. Uh, I wouldn't be as optimistic about the uh, um, communicative function of the monuments because I assume that most people who pass them don't really think about the history that happened. Uh, but you mentioned a couple of times that these are very important places, uh, so I'd like to ask you for whom are they important? Because I saw no people on the photograph, so what are the actors uh, using the monuments in the, in the discourse of, of co collective memory? Okay, thank you. thank you. Right, we had another question here. Yes, thanks. I was very much impressed by Jean Hyun's, uh, especially the introductory part of his presentation, where you were trying to put the Polish nationalists into a broader context. And you had a very interesting figure you quoted, uh, I think November or fall 1946, uh, that Germans, uh, there was some kind of a public opinion poll or something like this, and 36% of the German asked said that the extinction of Jews and Poles and other non-Aryans was essential for the security uh, of Germans. This is, well, what is the source for this? Uh, because that someone at this point publicly says things like this, it's, it's remarkable. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think there was one question in front, did you? Yeah, yeah that'll be the Thank final you. question for now. Uh, hello, my ahead. question for uh, Malka Storia and Bartolome Christian. Uh, about um, uh, in your presentations, which I found fascinating, uh, I was a bit craving for trying to, to have something about how in everyday life, people interact with these narratives that are very constructed, very much top down. So specifically for Bartolome, uh, did you observe people interacting with these monuments that you documented? And for Malkas, um, I would like to ask him specifically for, about the question of refugees uh, from Abkhazia. And uh, there was this case of the building that is now Sheraton Hotel that people were uh, uh, expelled. And that kind of shows a lot of authenticity of this national narrative. So. Okay, I'll, I'll just let people quickly answer these. Please try to keep your answers fairly short if we can. So, who first? In order? In order? In yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. In order. Um, uh, thank you very much for your comments and the questions. I think that the uh, there are lots of things to be discussed in this moment, but as a historian, I'm now thinking of the how to apply the new cultural history methodologies to the study of memory studies. For example, in the approaching this for Polish uh, conception, concept of nation in the primordialist way, could be indicated the, in, a, in the most illustri illustrative way in their usage of narodu narodowość. So in the, there is no distinction in the everyday Polish usage between na na nation and nationality. I mean, narodowość in a sense equivalent to narodowość, and, you know, nationality, and the narod is equivalent to nation. But actually, even a professional historian's works, they are using this narod and narodowość, you know, without any serious distinction. The same usage can be found in East Asia, in Korea. Minjo, uh, no, no, Kungmin, this is, a, there's no differentiation between nation and nationality. In a sense, this usage reflects a certain past, also certain people's way of perceiving the past. So, in this way, this uh, everyday usage of this Naruto and Naruto was also very much indicative. And the 1999, if they were 13 to 15 years old, now they are 30 years old. I think the, 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 these guys are really sort of uh, young opinion leaders, 
And these guys were educated, you know, 17 or 20 years ago. So I think this, there's a certain time gap between uh, uh, narrative template and today's, today's you know, certain uh, societal memory and social memories. And also, oh, this uh, November thing, so I got it from Tony Jutz's post-war. He, he picked a very, very interesting opinion post that was done in, I was really shocked. By, by finding out this sort of opinion poll. But nowadays, if you have a look at, for example, uh, what's the uh, Kamerad and Schindler. It's 1950, it's this uh, German POWs who returned from Soviet Union. And the, some of them who just betrayed their colleagues in the POW camp in Soviet Union. They were tried in the German court. But the punishment of those German soldiers, POWs, who betrayed their, soul, their colleagues, communists, the punishment, punishment was much severe than, than these uh, Nazi collaborators in the 1950s. So recent, recent research on this Kamerad and Shinda is really revealing and telling. So I, I, I was interested in this because in East Asia, there is a myth. Oh, Germans, you know, they are coming to terms with a Best was really good. Why Japanese bad guys are doing really, really, you know, terribly? But it's not true. So I mean, this sort of mythification of the coming to terms with the process in Europe is also, in a sense, influence today's contemporary uh, this memory making in East Asia. In the way, so entangled memory. So another example. Oh, so I leave there. Thank you. Excellent. Second speaker. <laughs> Thank you for. Does it work? Okay. Uh, thank you for the questions and comments. So maybe first of all, I want to make one comment to your comment, if I may. It wasn't a question, but when you were asking, uh, when you were talking, like, what is the common ground for uh, all three presentations? I can say as a guy who's living in the Caucasus and this poll in the same time. So I think that what is common for both narratives in uh, Georgia, Armenia, and Poland uh, is the fact how easily we are forgetting about these elements of the history, but these elements of the past, uh, which are not especially comfortable for us. I mean, uh, the Russians appeared in the South Caucasus because they were invited by the Georgian king to help the Georgians uh, fight with the Persians and Turks. But this is not the element of the memory discourse. Similar cases that we are not talking about the Armia Ludova, for example. We are not talking about the Polish nobles who are in the 19th century perfectly fitted in the, the system of the Russian Empire or Prussian Empire and so on. Um, and another element which is common is the fact that through the post-coloniality we can observe that actually um, the moment uh, when the Russia appeared, the external oppressor, both in Georgia and in Poland, that was the moment of the biggest civiliz civil civilizational uh, step, uh, step forward. Uh, I mean, Poland stopped to be a feudal country when the when 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 the when was occupied by the Russians, Austrians, and uh, Prussians. Similar case uh, in in Georgia, like Tbilisi in 19th century was developing uh, perfectly. So I think this is the uh, common ground. Now I will go to the question about uh, how important are Georgians, Azeris, and Armenians uh, to each other and what are the similarities. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm actually eligible to answer this question as far as I'm not Georgian, Azerbaijani, and Armenian, but I try to answer this question as an external observer and I think then uh, Malkas can add uh, something from the inside, let's say. I would say that something which is uh, similar for Georgians, Armenians, and Azerbaijanis is the question of the how history uh, how history is existing in everyday life I mean uh, I think Wojciech Gurecki wrote it down that uh, when here in Central Europe and in Western Europe we are counting in the years or in the decades in the Caucasus you're counting in hundreds and thousands of years you know, you're going back to the very ancient time you are just looking for the elements of discourse which are proving that you're a Georgia and many and Azerbaijani very very long time ago so I'll just give you an example explanatory example so Armenia in Armenian is Ayastan so the name is most probably derived from Haik, who was a grandson of Noe. So when the Noah uh, finished his trip on the Ararat mountain, uh, they stepped down and 
spread it all around. And Haik went to nowadays Armenia and he established the country. So what is going on in the Azerbaijan when the Armenians got this story? Azerbaijanis are saying that most probably Azerbaijanis are ancestors of uh, Kimers. And Kimer sounds very similarly to Gomer, who was other grandson of Anoe. And this is the thing which is joining all of these three nations, that we are digging as much as it possible to just prove that we are older than another one. Um, then uh, I would like to comment to the question which was to Malkas, uh, but I just wanted to say one word. This narrative, uh, it wasn't established in my opinion during the Misha's time. It was escalated during the Misha's time, but it was existing definitely much more before, even during the communist time. This narrative of the Russia was existing especially on the level of elites, of a, of a Georgian, uh, Georgian elites. I think the Malkas can, can add more about that. About the bridge between the East and West, I would say that there are two different bridges. Because when, when we are talking about the bridge between East and West here in Central Europe, we are thinking about the West, what is West of other, yeah? So the Germany, France, and so on. And East for us is Russia. But but uh, this bridge, if this uh, metaphor still might be valuable in the South Caucasus, it's something different. This is bridge between Occidental, what means Christian, and Oriental, what means Arab, Turks, and Persians, and so on. So this is this kind of bridge. So I think we are talking about the two, uh, I mean, like there are two different bridges and different considerations of this, uh, of this bridge. Um, and there's the question about what does it mean that those places are important. I think I didn't, if I said important, that was my mistake, because I mean, uh, if I meant important, I meant that uh, they are located uh, in such a way that it's not possible to not cross it, and it's done for, for purpose, you know? Uh, so, uh, you know, it could be done somewhere in the suburbia of a city, uh, but then this state drive and memory wouldn't be that influential uh, for the people. So uh, it's visible how this power knowledge discourse is existing in, uh, um, in the policy of erecting the uh, new status. And the last question was about uh, how every day, in everyday life, the people are interacting with these uh, elements. I can, I can answer with the, uh, I don't know, some examples from my observatory participation, uh, ethnographic research. Uh, so the uh, first example from the Hero Square in Tbilisi, every year when there is anniversary of the siege of Sohumi, there is huge march of the combatants, of the soldiers, mostly men, what is interesting, uh, who are going there, they are lying the flowers. Uh, so I wouldn't say that this is an interaction on everyday, it is interaction on everyday level because uh, even unconsciously when you are passing it, you are starting to think about your past because this information I got from the interviews, because when I'm talking with the people and I'm asking them, like, okay, so what do you think when you're crossing this hero square every day? And some people are saying, well, when I'm crossing this square, I always remember this conflict in Abkhazia. I won't forget it, because that was a terrible moment for me. I lost my family there, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I cannot, because I'm crossing this place, and this place is every day remember, uh, remembering me what happened those times. Uh, then, for example, uh, in the case of Genocide Museum in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in Yerevan, uh, there is like a huge uh, fireplace next to the museum. museum. Museum is underground, and there is the fireplace. And when the people are coming there, they're always putting the flowers. And they're crying. Like, I always, when I'm there, uh, I always see the people crying, really seriously uh, crying. And all of those uh, monuments, uh, especially in the frozen conflict areas I'm finishing, they're always uh, surrounded by flowers. The people are always lying those flowers. So there is no even one single monument which the people are not taking care about, you know? So it's like, uh, extremely interesting view when you're seeing the monument which is standing in the middle of nowhere where is the trash all around but the monument is like from the fairy tale you know so that, that this is this way of interaction that the people are taking care about this memory which is kept in this uh, in this monument yeah thank you that's all. To <clears throat> so um, thank you for your interesting comments and questions from the auditorium uh, First comment I would like to refer to is about nationalities policy during Soviet time. Of course, not everywhere in Soviet space this national identity was created. Uh, for example, in Armenia and in Georgian case, that was pre-Soviet strong national identity was exist existence. Uh, it, it existed, but 
Soviet nationalist policy uh, placed new emphasis on these national markets or edited. For example, Stalin literally, with his with pen, uh, corrected the historic textbooks of Georgia during Soviet time. He invited Georgian historian in, in, in his dacha in Abkhazia and asked kindly, them kindly, uh, that maybe it could be better to include this or that or exclude. And they were, you know, had to uh, consider his, his uh, kind asking request, for example. So, uh, um, uh, uh, about these uh, agencies, uh, how Armenians, Azerbaijanis, or Georgians kind of coordinate uh, in terms of memory, there was a, you, uh, technically there was an attempt to create common textbook in Caucasus, Caucas but it was impossible, or impossible now. Uh, uh, to to write this kind of common text because there's so many historical debates uh, in every aspect of the medieval, especially medieval or even antiquity uh, of this, the history, which especially within Georgia, um, between Georgians and Armenians, because uh, they both ha uh, have ethnocentric narrative and they also claim their priority or, uh, or, 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 or they take their pretenses um, on certain territories. So primordiality or mapping this uh, memory is really crucial uh, part of the, the identity policy. Um, uh, but after the so-called Rose Revolution, there was an, a reform. Uh, um, uh, so it was the first attempt, I, I believe, uh, in post-Soviet space, ex uh, except of uh, Baltic states, of course, uh, that uh, uh, in school curricula, uh, this mono-ethnic and mono, uh, uh, mono-ethnic perspective was changed in history textbooks, and uh, uh, other minorities, for example, Azerbaijanis and Armenians were included as a part of Georgian history or Georgian culture. Uh, for example, we can find um, uh, stories about uh, Georgia, Azerbaijani heroes who served their country, Georgia, I mean. And even Saakashvili mentioned that he, uh, frequently that Armenians who, who live, uh, live in, um, which live in uh, um, a south uh, region of Georgia, Stopped Russian tank during the, the August War in 2008. So uh, this, there is a need in identity level to stress on the role of other minorities uh, to, to defend their country, I mean Georgia. Um, uh, so uh, about master narrative uh, Abkhazia, and uh, uh, there was not changed. It, it, it always existed. Of course, there was a different emphasis. Uh, during Saakashvili's, it was uh, revit revitalized. Uh, more, it, it became more intensive. Even in Soviet period, uh, you know, Georgia, uh, Georgians like uh, feasting and toasting, and this uh, uh, table culture or feasting culture is very important. And uh, Stephen Jones, this American scholar, uh, was talking about kind of fragmented national narrative. During the Soviet period, national narrative wa was, of course, Bend, but this uh, uh, South society with uh, a lot of informal networks uh, reproduced or cultivated this narrative in this feasting or in, in, in gossip, and uh, this national and the issue of Russian occupation was never forgotten, and it was reproduced, but not in school curricula, of course, but in the, you know, during the conversation or during the gossip on the, the feasting or in toasting, um, uh, and. Uh, uh, about these uh, refugees, uh, uh, refugees' uh, uh, memories completely correspond to to this national narrative. We, our memory study center, uh, now uh, now is conducting the research about IDP memories, uh, and uh, we hope we will present these results in in in, in this year. Um, uh, um, but uh, the role of Russia is more stressed there. How Russian troops 
in way that Abkhazia, how they helped separatist movements, uh, and uh, Russian, how Russian jets bombed this uh, Sukhumi, and then this small part of uh, population of Abkhazia, like uh, separatists, they seize the Sukhumi. Not Abkhazians themselves seize the Sukhumi, according to this narrative, but Russians and the North Caucasians volunteers. Uh, and I did not get this uh, question about the hotels. What, uh, what can you f explain further? You have, you have um, the situation in the center of the Ah, yeah, you mean this, uh, yeah. He, uh, the new policy of the government, the, there's a Ministry of Refugees and uh, uh, IDPs in Georgia, uh, they, have a program during this, this started in the Saakashvili period, um, um, accommodation program, and this IDPs were uh, resettled. And this is now this uh, Redison Blue uh, Iveria Hotel. It's a fancy hotel now. Not the uh, IDPs uh, don't, don't live there now. And they, they have more or less comfortable roof under them. So. They resisted, of course, because they they don't, did not have clear understanding of what. Uh, but then, yeah. So I, I clearly ensure the, ensure you that uh, this uh, IDP collective center does not exist anymore. There's a fancy hotel there now. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay. Thank you very much to our three panelists and also to our discussant. And I think it's time now for lunch, and we're returning at 2:30. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>